invitation. Thank you for being here to this school. It's not my first time. It's a pleasure to see that this school grows up and becomes more and more popular over the years. So I will try to give you some messages about quantum mechanics. Perhaps some of you, some uh, you already know of by reading some uh, literature or some other talks. And uh, I will try to this to come to this quantum non-locality, which is uh, over the here has been discussed whether it was science fiction or really something that nature belongs to nature. And we will see what comes out of that. So I will start with the quantum mechanics and the quantum mechanical description of matter. Matter is basically everything. There is light, there are forces, but most of it is, is matter. We are made of matter, everything is matter. So just some examples in the picture. The one of the biggest achievements of the last 150 years, more or less, is that matter, matter is made of atoms. Now you learn that in school, it's something that is trivially conveyed to you, so no surprise about that. But if you look at the history of science, there's been a huge discussion about that. It goes back to the Greeks and probably even before the Greeks, whether matter is continuous, so you can cut matter indefinitely in smaller and smaller pieces, or whether at some point you, you have to stop in dividing matter. So atoms comes from the Greek word atomos, more or less. I don't know Greek so much, which means indivisible. So behind that, you can't go. And actually, it was fun that some couple of years ago, I gave a similar, of course, much simpler lecture on quantum mechanics to middle school kids. So you are more or less at the end of high school, I suppose. Uh, the kids were in the, in, uh, at the beginning of, oh, no, it was in elementary school, not even middle schools. And I asked the question whether matter is, can be divided forever, or whether matter, at some point, comes to a point where you cannot divide it anymore. And the kids thought about that and gave answers in, one, in favor of one option and in favor of another option. So it's, it's something that uh, still puzzles people. Now you are used to atoms, so you just give the answer. But when you are a kid, you, you really put a thought into that, and the history of philosophy and the history of science also gave a lot of attention to this, to the point that only recently, 150 years ago, we came basically to, to the agreement that matter is made of atoms. And with atoms, the building blocks of matter, you easily describe everything. So you describe the states of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. It's basically just different way, uh, ways in which the atoms are glued to each or not glued to each other. And basically, it's like a, a Lego game. You have different pieces that you assemble in different ways, and you have all the shapes that you want. So it's a huge achievement, if you, if you really think about that. It's a huge achievement of human knowledge to come to the conclusion that the vast variety of matter, the almost infinite for possible forms and shapes that matter can take, can be brought down to few building blocks, not just two or three, around 100, but most of it, it's basically 50, uh, 20 probably atoms, different atoms that make most of the matter we know of. And so, this atom, so what is the, then the, the atom? We come to the atom. The atom is indivisible, uh, uh, as the name would suggest, or is there something more to say about that? Can we ask the question, what is the atom made of? Probably you already know the answer about that, it's also taught in uh, in a high school, the atom now we know. There was also quite a long process that took some 50 years, more or less, between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, to understand that the atom is not indivisible. The atom is, is also a composite system, is made by a nucleus, which, is, which contains almost all the mass and the positive charge, around which electrons revolve like planets around the sun. So this is a typical picture, and now it's part of the popular imagination. So the atom is not in... So we have several messages about that. The atom is not indivisible. The atom is divisible. You can divide it in electrons and nucleus, and then actually the story goes on. And probably you had lectures about that. The nucleus is also not elementary. It's made of protons and neutrons, and the protons and neutrons are not elementary. They are made of quarks, and then who knows what will come in the, in the future years. So there is a structure inside, which makes things in some sense even simpler, because all 100 and more atoms we know of have all the same structure, which can be described in terms of the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So the story is even simpler. There's also something interesting about uh, There's another interesting piece of information about that, that if you expand, so to say, the atom, and you bring it, just to make a comparison, to have the size of a soccer field, then the nucleus has the size of a raisin. So you have to think of an atom as basically something empty, a raisin in the middle of a soccer field, and only at the edge of the soccer field the electrons revolve. 
So it's, I don't know, perhaps fascinating, perhaps scary way to look at that, that we are basically empty, we are. There are just little dots, vastly separated among themselves, and with some point-like electrons going around that. This is what matter is made of. But I want to come to the point of the talk. This is just an introduction. There is a problem here. Probably, at least some of you know about a problem with a description of an atom like that, a positive charge, nucleus, around which the electrons rotate. So who of you do, knows the problem with this description? I don't know if you, you have been told, at least in the last year of high school, when you do some electromagnetism, I suppose, or at least in my times. Is there a problem with such a description? Speak up, someone. Exactly. So why should they lose energy? So he said, so for those of you who didn't hear, the correct answer, the electrons lose energy and then they fall in the nucleus. Why do they do that? Why should they do that? Okay. Exactly. A correct answer. They are charged. And electromagnetism says that every time a charged particle is accelerated and the curved trajectory is accelerated, only straight trajectories are not, and with constant velocity, of course. So every time a charged particle curves, it should emit radiation, which is actually the way in which antennas work. Why do you transmit a signal with your mobile phone? Because there are electrons being actually accelerated. They emit radiation, electromagnetic signal that goes wherever it goes, and also it's the same way in which it is received. The electromagnetic signal uh, imposes an acceleration on particles. So the electron should uh, emit radiation and fall on the nucleus. This, in principle, is not a vast, so it's, it is disturbing, but it's not a vast problem. Even the Earth, actually, is losing energy and falling around the sun, on the sun. But there is a vast difference between, difference between the two situations. In the case of the Earth, this loss, the loss of radiation is due, uh, the loss of uh, energy is due to friction, basically. And, uh, the Earth will take a vast amount of time before it falls in the sun. The loss of energy is really tiny compared to the uh, motion around the sun, so you can safely neglect that. In the case of the atom, in the case of electrons, if you do the calculation, the prediction, the classical prediction is that in a fraction of a second, the electron should explode, should, uh, not the electron per se, should emit a lot of uh, radiation, lose a lot of energy, and fall in the nucleus. So it's a combination nucleus. So it's a combination of the two things, this loss of radiation and the fact that this loss of radiation should be almost instantaneous. So, so which means that matter, as we know it, should not exist. And this is, if now, I mean, you know about this and you're not surprised anymore, but if you think about that, this is a, a catastrophe, this is a tragedy. Classic, so we are at the end, 100 years ago, more or less, 120 years ago, at the end of the 19th century, the, the best physical theories that we had, Newtonian mechanics and electromagnetism, which were successful in describing more or less everything, failed on the most important point they failed. They were not able to describe the atom, and in that sense, they were not able to describe anything. If you, don't, if you can't describe atoms, if you can't describe matter, you don't describe anything, because everything is based on matter and the motion of matter. That's the, and that was the end, basically, of classical mechanics. The solution, perhaps you... So this is the picture of the problem. Electrons radiate, uh, uh, and then they lose energy and they fall on the nucleus. The solution came from quantum mechanics. So that I cannot make a whole lecture about quantum mechanics. Perhaps you also know already some, uh, something about that. The uh, solution came by changing the, our way of understanding matter at a microscopic scale and changing our idea on the nature of matter. Matter is not particles, little particles, point-like that move along trajectories anymore, matter on the microscopic scale behaves more like a wave. So it, it has a completely different nature. Having a completely different nature means that you have to change the theory and then description and the understanding of, uh, of physics. So it is, uh, elementary particles are more like waves, and only when you observe them, when you interact with the microscopic system, so to say you, you scare them and they 
collapse, they concentrate to a point, and they show up the particle behavior. But if you let them alone, they are more like a wave. I don't know if I have the picture. Yes, I have the picture. So, that, so the, in, a, in a pictorial way, if one should solve the, equation, the equations of quantum mechanics, which are not easy. So if you do physics in university, you will do that. Otherwise, be happy with the picture, because it basically says the same thing, more or less, that the electron is not anymore a particle around the nucleus, but the electron, you should think of the electron more like a wave around the nucleus. And then there are solutions of the equations from the mathematical point of view, or oh, special configurations, special orbits around the nucleus, where this wave is stable, it is happy. So it it, the wave moves like a wave, so oscillates around the nucleus like a wave, but in a stable way. It doesn't have any desire to fall farther into the nucleus. It's only that, so to say, when it is in between, that it wants to go somewhere. It wants to go to a stable orbit. So you have the orbits in the atoms. But if it's in a stable orbit, it, it likes to stay in a stable orbit. If you want to change the orbit, you have to kick the electron, which is what physicists do with electromagnetic signal, with a laser. You kick the electron, and it goes up. You kick the electron, and it goes down. Otherwise, they, stay, they tend to stay in this uh, stable orbits. There are a specific number of orbits separated with the energy gap one from the other, and that's you have quantization. That's why one of the reasons why people talk of quantum mechanics as opposed to classical mechanics. Quantum is a Latin word which means a fixed amount of quantum, a fixed amount of and then you have a fixed amount of, of energies. You cannot choose the orbit you want. You have to make a selection among a specific number of uh, orbits. Uh, the atom is quantized. That's what people say. OK. But then, and then this is again the introduction to my main point uh, today, the question is, but OK, this is a nice way of solving things. This is what Bohr, De Broglie, probably names that you have heard of in a school did. But is it really true that electrons are like waves? OK, we are using this description to solve, the, to uh, try to explain why the atom is stable instead of being unstable. But is it, it is a good idea. This is really the correct answer, and then you have to do experiments to check whether electrons behave, behave like waves or not. And the typical way of deciding whether there is or there is not a wave is to do a double slit experiment, which is the two options there. So you have a screen with two slits and then a photographic plate, and then you send what you think it is a wave. If it is a wave, if it behaves as in the right picture with a a darker and brighter spots uh, which alternate with each other, or if it's more like a particle, something more solid, not a wave that spreads around, then you have just two lines, be two lines behind, the, be behind the, uh, the two slits. So this is the way to describe the particle versus wave behavior, which is actually what Young did in 1801. I don't know if you if they came to the point of, in school of discussing the experiment performed by Young, we were, so 1801, so we go back to the 700th, uh, uh, 18th century, when Newton and Huygens and people were fighting against each other about the nature of light. Newton thought that everything was made of matter, everything was made of particles, and so also light is made of particles. That was the idea of Newton. Huygens said, no, I think it's more like a wave, because I think it better described the situation. And then who was right, who was wrong? Young did the experiment. Newton would have got, if Newton were right, the outcome would have been the one on the left. If Huygens were right, the outcome would have been the one on the right. Huygens won. Light is a wave. Light. And then you have electromagnetism, Maxwell, and all these kind of things. So this is a typical way that, in which a physicist decides whether there is or there is not a wave behavior. And that's the solution. So people did that. They did it with electrons, they did it with atoms, they did it with molecules, they did it, and what happens? So you have three different shots at three different times. You start to send single particles, one at a time, and you do with single particles because you don't want, if you throw all the particles, they interact with each other in a very complicated way, and no one knows what happens. If you do it with a single particle at a time, you have a much simpler situation. And you see that this, when they hit the screen, they hit in a single place, which is the place where the particle uh, falls, basically. But then if you run the experiment more and more often, you start seeing this wave behavior, this uh, uh, 
bright spots uh, together with uh, darker spots where there are more or less particles, typical of the wave phenomenon. Actually, so quantum mechanics is weird, weirder than that. It's not that matter is made of waves, it's a, there is a particle behavior, a wave behavior, and to explain what that really means, I would take another lecture, which is not the lecture of today. How do people describe this behavior? Like every time there is a wave with a superposition. Superposition of different situations. You have probably, you have, you have, you, I mean, you certainly not probably had experience of this superposition with water waves. So if you play, or you can imagine to play with water waves and sending and throwing rocks, stones in the, in the, in the water, if you throw one stone, you have circular waves propagating. If you throw a stone in the other side, you have, not far away, too far away, you have another circular waves. If you throw the stones simultaneously, you have two set of singular, sets of, of circular waves that propagate and sum. You just have the sum, one with each other. You have a superposition. Or when the reason why you can talk over the mobile phone simultaneously, one here and one there, with your, not with each other, with your friends. The person talking there with the mobile phone sends a signal somewhere. The other person on the other side, talking over the phone, sends another signal. That's two signals, they cross each other, and they superimpose. One goes one way, one goes on the other way simultaneously. And so you can simultaneously talk over the phone. You don't have to wait the other one to finish talking before you can start. It's another example of a superposition principle. You superimpose situations. You have one situation, you can have the other, or you can have both at the same time. With matter, and this is the astonishing fact of quantum mechanics and the interpretation that people give, give of this experiment, which is something that you see in the laboratory, that even matter goes in a superposition, and especially in a spatial superposition. If you can have a particle or an atom here, if you, are, you can have also a particle or an atom there, and according to quantum mechanics, you can have also the superposition of the same atom here and there. That's one of the predictions of quantum mechanics, which is in the way in which the theory explains experimental evidence. And now we start our journey through quantum non-locality. The question is, what does it mean that there is a superposition here and there? Well, I will not, I, don't be disappointed, I will not answer the question at the end of the day, but the question will go through the entire talk. Well, I mean, uh, with the wave, so you have experience of water wave, the answer, what does it mean that you have the superposition of two waves? Well, one wave goes this way, one wave goes the other way, then they both go together at the same time, one way and the other way. It's just superimposed. So you have a, an idea of that. But with matter, with an atom, so if I have, so suppose this is an atom, what, is, what does it mean that it's in a superposition here and there? This is against the basic fact of matter, which goes back again to the Greek philosophy. So it's something that is rooted in our culture since. 2,000, even more, 2,500 years. So the basic property of matter is that it is somewhere. This is the fundamental property. An object, first of all, is somewhere. And then perhaps it's round or, cube, or it's a cube, it's yellow, it's blue, these are other properties. But this is the fundamental property of matter. Now with quantum mechanics, it seems that we are objecting this fundamental property of matter. An object doesn't have to be necessarily somewhere, can be in more than one place at the same time. That's quite fascinating. That was the issue of the discussion about quantum mechanics. When people proposed that, it was not accepted, OK, we change, so what? There was a beginning of a vast discussion that is still ongoing in the community, so for over 100 years. And basically, the two champions at the beginning of the two opposite positions were Einstein and Bohr. So Einstein is the, uh, is the first one that you see here. Einstein will say, no, it's not acceptable. It doesn't make any sense to say that an object can be in two places at the same time. It is always either here or there. It is simply our ignorance about the state of the system. So the situation for him is like, if I, it's like taking a box with a ball, a marble. You split the box in two parts, and you separate the two parts. It's not that the, the, the marble is here and there. It's just here or there. You simply don't know. You open and you see. 
but it's one, in one place or the other. So Einstein was saying that when you have this superposition, it doesn't literally, in the true sense, means that the atom is here and there at the same time. It is here or there. I don't know. And then I have to find out. And with experiments, I find out. And in fact, I just go back once again. If I make an experiment, you see, there is always one spot. The, the atom doesn't go in two spots. It always goes in one spot at the same time. So that was the position of Einstein. Bohr was saying the opposite. No, it's not the way you say. It is, you have to take the uh, wave function, this, this wave, in the true sense of being, in the, being uh, potentially in both places at the same time. This is, in a technical sense, a complete versus incomplete description of physics. So in the completeness hypothesis of Bohr, the wave function tells everything there is to say about the state of the particle, about the state of the atom. If there is a superposition, there is a superposition here and there. End of the story. Don't ask for anything more than that. The incompleteness idea, which is the one of Einstein, said, no, there is more to that. The particle is somewhere. I just, I just do not know. But it is somewhere. And this was the vast debate at the beginning of the 20th century when quantum mechanics was wrong. Einstein was so much convinced about this uh, state of affairs that he came up with more and more refined uh, 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 paradoxes to explain why he thought he was right and Bohr was wrong. And probably the most effective one is Einstein's box, so-called Einstein's box, something that you find in the literature. And basically, I already mentioned about that. So if you have a particle in a box, and you have the wave function, so the wave function, one of the natures of the wave function is to spread. The wave function, you have to think, you know, when, if you have water and you drop some ink, the ink diffuses and colors the entire glass. So the nature of the quantum wave function is exactly of that kind. When you let a particle alone, it wants to diffuse, to spread as much as possible. So if you put a particle in a box and you close the box and you let the particle alone, in a very short time, the wave function describing the particle will be almost homogeneously distributed everywhere in the box. OK, so we have a particle in a box. Then NASA says, the, one, the thing I told you before, cut the box in two pieces without looking where the particle is, and separate the two parts of the box. So you have a generated a superposition. Particle in the box on the left, particle in the box on the right. And then he asks the question, again, the question that I, I already phrased before. What does it mean that there is, that the particle is in a superposition of being on the left and being on the right? Again, let's go, so where is the particle? Let's go through the two possibilities. The incomplete assumption says the particle is somewhere, in the picture is on the right. I just do not know. So Psi, the wave function, is my, reflects my ignorance about the true position of the particle. The particle is a particle. It's like matter. It's always somewhere. It's on the right. Could be on the left. One, one half and one half chances. The inco so if I, and then when I look in the left box, for example, and I do not find the particle in the left box, then OK, it must be in the right. It must be somewhere. It is on the right. OK, so I learned where the particle is. Before, I didn't know where the particle was, and so I had this superposition to describe the situation. Now I know where the particle is, and so the particle is on the left. I update it. I learn more. That's actually how knowledge works. You learn more by experience, by doing experiment. So something very simple, very easy. No problem at all. But then let's consider the other situation, so the incompleteness assumption. So now the wave function is not my ignorance. The wave function is the real maximal description of the situation that we are considering. I, I, there is no possibility for me to say anything more than that. But then, when I look, so that's why I didn't put the little man, because the little man doesn't, matter, doesn't, doesn't play any role. This is the state of the particle. It's not the ignorance of the person. So when someone looks and doesn't find the particle on the left, then something important happens. The true state, the true description of the particle changes instantly both on the left and both on the right. Because before the observation, 
There was no fact, there was nothing about the position of the particle. This is the idea of the complete description. The wave function tells that there is no fact, that you do, cannot think that the particle is here or there, is here and there in some sense, whatever that means. But if you make the measurement, you do not find the particle here, it must be there. So you created some fact, both on the left and both on the right. And that's why Einstein thought that this was the conclusive argument against the, this interpretation. This is a non-local effect, because you can think that the two boxes, one is, is here in Rome, one is in Sydney, for example, no one does a measurement, so you just let the, part, the box go to Sydney. I open the box in Rome, I do not find the particle, and then instantly the situation has changed also in Sydney, because the particle will be there in the box in Sydney. This is a completely non-local effect. And for Einstein, who was the father of relativity, and relativity is based on the idea of locality, that things can disturb only at the speed of light, no faster than that, says, no, this is not, not acceptable, so this position has to be rejected. And then the question is, so if, if it is so easy, so, the most reasonable position to take is the one of Einstein. So, why do I do? Why care? Why discussing for 100 years about this fact? It cannot certainly be so crazy that if I open the box here, I change instantly the situation in Sydney. Then, the ball, the, the marble, the particle was in Sydney from the very beginning. So, why discussing about the situation? The Einstein argument is convincing, end of the story. But then there are two problems about that. There are. That the first one, it's not a, it's a more a psychological problem than a really scientific one, that if you go along with what Einstein is saying, then you are accepting that the theory is incomplete. You are accepting. So that there's something missing in the theory. That is not the old story. That is not correct. That you have to look for a new theory of nature. And then, suppose that now you do something you go to your parents and you do something that you think you a big discovery, that you think it's a great discovery, whatever it is in your life, a big achievement, you think. And then your parents tell you, hmm, it's not sufficient. Something is missing. You have to work harder. Then you will be disappointed. You would be. And that's like what happened in the community at that time. There were Bohr and the other people that defended the theory because they thought that this was the right theory of nature. It was, there was a, usually, I mean, scientists are human beings, and they behave like all human beings, and then they, they want to defend the theory. So if they, you want to defend the theory, the theory has to be complete, and so you have to reject the argument of Einstein. So this is a psychological motivation, if you wish. The more scientific motivation is that, again, it's a double-slit experiment. That if, you, if you go back to a classical idea of the particle, then you are not capable of describing the double-slit experiment. You, if it's all particles, so why? If you play with the slits, you see a wave behavior instead of a particle behavior. So if you start opening, and in particular this picture, let's go back to this one. This picture tells you that if the particles are really particles, then if you do the experiment on the right where both slits are open, or you do alternatively, the two on the left, you randomly close one of the two, things shouldn't change. Because in both cases, some particles go through the lower slit, some particles go through the upper slit, whether you, you alternatively close one of the two slits or you don't close the two slits. Nothing changes, just particles. If it goes in the upper slit, it goes in the upper slit, independently of whether you decided to close the lower slit or not. But this is not what happens in reality. If you start playing with opening and closing the slits, you kill the interference pattern, and which survives only if the two slits are open, which is a typical situation that happens only if there are waves. And this is, so this is the situation. Einstein, of course, was not an idiot. He knew about this thing. So you cannot just simply go back to classical mechanics. It's made of particles. There must be something more to that that no one was uh, able to describe. And precisely because there was this something more to that, that the other part of the story, so Bohr and the other people, were defending the idea of completeness. But let's go now to the point of 
my talk. And so, first of all, 50 years of history in one minute, and then we go back and we try to slowly understand. So in 1935, Einstein makes the same argument, it just in a different way, basically. And it is the famous EPR argument, Einstein, Poldowski, Rosen, which if you start to look about the books on foundations of quantum mechanics, you immediately bump into the EPR argument, 1935. The idea, again, of incompleteness of quantum mechanics. Paper vastly ignored, and at the time it is famous only now. At that time it was basically ignored. A couple of answers and end of the stories. Then we have to wait the 50s, so in between there was historical development, but mainly there was World War II. Uh, in the beginning, it was a disaster in many ways. It was a disaster also for science. It distracted the scientific community from research. So we have to wait the end of World War II and peace again to continue with research. And David Bohm came with what is now called Bohmian mechanics. He actually succeeded in what Bohr and the other people said was impossible. He created a quantum mechanical theory, a new theory of quantum phenomena in terms of particles moving along definite trajectories. So it is possible to make a theory of particles, but it's a funny theory. It's not what Einstein wanted, because it is a very non-local theory. Einstein wanted to have a local theory of particles moving like particles, perhaps not straight, they, they wiggle around, but a theory of particles which is local without instantaneous interaction at a distance. Bohm did half of the job. He created a theory of particles, actually it was De Broglie at the beginning, but Bohm made it in a more consistent theory, but it was vastly non-local. Then, ten years later, in the 60s, more or less, John Bell came. He, he didn't like quantum mechanics because he didn't like this like, wave particle, all this mess with the, that. He liked very much Bohm mechanics because Bohm mechanics is a clear theory. As I said, it's a theory of particles that they just don't go straight. They go like drunken men following, following a wave, so to say. So it's a new. So instead of Newton equations, you have new equations, but otherwise it's like Newtonian mechanics. But of course, he didn't like locality. He wanted a local theory because relativity it was and still is one of the dominant dogmas at that time. He tried to make, in a simple model, a relativistic theory. No way, he didn't succeed. And then at one point, at some point, he came to thinking, but is that simply me being incapable of making a relativistic theory? Or is there a reason why that it is in principle impossible to make a relativistic theory of particles? And then this question was mathematically phrased in terms of famous inequalities, which is what I will tell you now about, which are called Bell inequalities, which is one of the most important achievements of the last 100 years in our understanding of the foundations of nature. In the 80s, 20 years later, technology was ready to test these inequalities, and then I will tell you the outcome about that. So you see how nicely things so from philosophical, if you wish, debate to theoretical modeling to precise experimental quantities which can be measured. And actually one could add now all the business in quantum technology. All the business in quantum technology is based on these ideas. So now let's start our game to understand Bell inequalities, basically, and the true content of Bell inequalities. So the game is the following one, it is. We have two people. Alice and Bob, that play a game in front of an audience, like you now, for example, and they want to surprise the people. Okay, the game is a, little, is a bit dull, the game, but it, so you wouldn't go on TV with this game, but still, it, it serves the purpose of, under, of uh, this, describing a physical situation. So the people, the audience, so you give to Alice, so the Alice and Bob are in two separate boxes. They cannot talk to each other, they cannot see each other, they cannot communicate to each other. You can check, you can screen, no mobile phone, no nothing. They are completely independent one from the other. You give a card, one simultaneously, one to Alice and one to Bob, and on the card there is a number, one, two, three. You decide the number to give to Alice and Bob. It's completely up to you which number to give to Alice and Bob. And then Alice and Bob write yes or no. Kind of silly, but let's wait a little bit. So they give Alice and Bob, they give the card back to you. There is written yes and no, or no. They decide what to do. So everything is done simultaneously. Alice and Bob are far, can be far away from each other. 
they cannot talk to each other. And that's the outcome. So the outcome of this is an example, so, and, you do, and you repeat the game over and over. So one run, second run, and so on. Each, they, they, so apparently, Alice and Bob, A and B, they, so this is an example, so run one, two, three, up to eight. Then th this is a, a possible situation of, of numbers that have, were given on the card, one and three in the first round, two and two in the second round, two and three in the third round, and whatever. You decide, it's up to you. So the game is the, the situation is the following one, that apparently the answers they give is completely random. There's nothing surprising. It's a very stupid game. Except for one point, that every time that they receive a card with the same number, they always, no mistake, give the same answer, either yes or either no. So you have to imagine that, that you really, they're far away in two different countries, you give You'd give you always cards with different numbers. At some point, it's up to you. You give the card with the same number, and they give you always the same answer. And then they make money out of that because they claim we are telepathic. We can talk to each other instantly at a distance, not in a physical way, in a mental way, because physically you have blocked everything. And we can amaze you by giving the same answer. So, by the way, this is not a fictitious game. Physics allows for that. We will come at the end. So you have to think of something that is not science. So this is the first part of the talk, science fiction. It is not science fiction. This is something that can be done. And actually, it has been done. Actually, not, not, not in this glamorous way in TV, but more experimentally, so to say. So now it is the question to you. How is it possible? Do we just live with that? Or is there an answer to that, an explanation to that? Would you so easily, so immediately buy the idea that they are telepathic, or do you have an explanation for that? So think that we are really now in front of TV. Now you are, you are I mean, you, you live in the age of technology, you know that people cheat all the time, so you wouldn't, I, I bet you wouldn't buy that so easily. So, what would be a possible explanation for that? Sorry? No, they are not. No, they are far away. Really, two different human beings. No, no, they're just two people that... Uh, are, you, have to, you have to think in the, the way I, I present it. Really, two different persons they are. Someone was... Louder, I cannot hear you. No, no, there are different people. No, you can check that. No? They are different, I mean, no, they're different people. One at a time, okay, I saw you first, then we go back. That is, <laughs> okay, that is actually, that has a technical term for that, super determinism. It has, it, everything has been decided from the very beginning. So this is an option, no, but let's not be so, so wild. But it, actually, people discuss about that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an option on the table, but let's, no, let's, let's suppose that they are born from different parents and no, they, you, can, you can do a DNA test and there is no significant connection among the two. But people discuss about it, so it's like a good answer. So there was you then, after. Sorry? No, that there, is a, there is a possible way out. Okay. Think it's infinite, think. I made only eight of them. Think that you made 1,000, 10,000, 1 million, 10 billion. Doesn't change. No, that's no, no, you don't have to. Never. You always, that, that's the goal of science is to understand, is not to accept things. Yeah, yes, that's true. So let's, let's as a theoretical physicist, try to understand that. 
Yes, so there is the experimental way, but there's also the theoretical way, the way people try to understand things. It's true. But as theoreticians, we make hypotheses. We could try, that can be done, that wouldn't change the situation. So you have to trust me, the game wouldn't change with three people. It would still stay, the, the, the mystery, so to say, would still stay there. Let, let me just go to the, uh, your other colleague there. Okay, so I, I'm not sure I understand you, but I think I did. So I give the answer, which is, I think, the simpler way of what you said. But I think you're right, if I understood it correctly. Sorry? So you are saying that every, so that both they answer alternatively twice yes and one no? Something of the sort. Wait, wait, no, not, not at the same time. So you finish quick and then two. Ah, so what? Ah. Sorry? Okay, but how they can agree? Can they agree? They don't know when the, which card they receive. Okay, last one. If you want to, then I will give you the answer. I mean, it's contained in what you say somehow. So you are on the right. So she was in the first row. Hmm? But uh, what do you mean probability? No, no, they always answer, so the point is that with certainty, when they, give, they get the same card, they answer the same way. It's not a probabilistic fact, it's always. Okay, I give you the, I mean, it, it is there, but I give you the answer, which is somehow contained in what you were saying. They agreed beforehand what to answer. As simple as that. So, they, before starting the game, they just wrote a long book, and they agreed that, do I have a pointer here? Yes, this is a pointer, yes. They, they agreed that if, so we make a book, this is the book with all possible answers, which we just write randomly. And then the agreement is that if in the first round we get the card one, then we answer yes. If we get the card with number two, we answer yes, and then no, and so on and so forth. So they, so they couldn't uh, memorize it, but let's think that they have the copy of the book, and then that's the situation. In the first run, here, doesn't work. So Al, you gave to Alice the card with number one, and she answered yes. You gave to Bob the card with number three, you an the answer was no. And then in the round number two, you decided to give the card with the same number, two and two, and of course they give the same answer. So that's a disappointing way to spoil a game. They just agreed beforehand. And that explains everything. That explains almost. You have to still to finish the game. Uh, because it's explained. You see that outcomes are random. There is no apparent logic, completely random, except for the fact that when you give the same number, they give the same answer. And of course they have to give the same answer. And if you go back to quantum mechanics, this was precisely the idea of Einstein. Things, so the answer to the game, so properties, exist from the very beginning. So Alice and Bob had knew the answer before you gave the card, before you made the question. They already knew what they would have answered. So that, that is, so you didn't know how to tell me, you didn't know 
what the answer was, because you didn't have access to the book. They only had the book. And that's what happens here. Basically, this is the way to explain, let me go back, this situation here. It's not like this, that the answers are made up by Alice and Bob on the moment. Then they would be really telepathic. They would be. So if they really make the answers in the moment and they give the same answer, they must be telepathic. No, the answers were there from the very beginning, in completeness. You don't know, but the answer was already there. They just had they just w they were waiting for you to ask the question, and then they would have looked at the book and given the an answer. So this is Einstein, incompleteness. The game is spoiled. Again, the basic point. There is no telepathy. So why, let me go back again some psychology. At least some of you couldn't believe that there was telepathy. They cannot really talk to each other. There must be a reason behind so why you didn't accept simply telepathy? Because of locality, not telepathy. In other words, Alice and Bob cannot communicate instantly at a distance. In other words, locality, because this is the way it works. If you want to talk to a person, it takes some time. Perhaps the speed of light for a phone call, or you have to walk to the person, but you cannot instantly talk to a person. The speed of light is great, so it's almost instantly, but it's not really instantly. So, if you want no telepathy, if you want locality, then the answers given by Alice and Bob were decided beforehand. In other words, they existed before the game. In other words, our knowledge about the game was incomplete. And that's exactly what Einstein was saying. I believe in locality, so incompleteness. There is something more than just superposition. But it's not the end of the story. Because now Bob Bell comes. And Bell does one thing. He decides to look at the entire statistics of the game, not only at the, in the situation where you give the card with the same number, which was two, five, and six, I don't remember which was. So if you look at the statistics of the book, what do you find out? You find out that there are these possibilities. If you give... Bloody, doesn't work. So if you give one, the card one and one, so, so, so take round number one. If you give the card one and one, they would agree. A means agreement, this mean, D means disagreement. They agree on the answer. But also if you give the card, also if uh, Alice is given the card number two and Bob is given the card number one, there is an agreement. And so for all these options, and this one, only if you come to the point that Alice is given card with the number three and Bob is given the card with number one, there is a disagreement. So you, in this situation, there are five agreements possible agreements, and four possible disagreements. If you go to up to round number five, there will always be an agreement independently from the card you give. So the moral is that if you look at the entire statistics of the possible book they had, there should be that the number of agreements is larger than the number of disagreements, A larger than D. Bell, this is basically a simple version of Bell inequalities from 1935 to the 60s, so th th uh, 30 years of theoretical research summarized in one game, in one slide. So if there is a book, so if they agreed on the answer, from the, the answer was there from the very beginning, from one way or another, they just looked and decided, so if because of non-locality, then the entire statistics should tell me that the number of at a time they agree, even if you give them different cards, you see that even if you give, give different cards, they might agree. They might disagree, but they might agree. So if you look at the entire statistics, the number of agreements should be more than the number of disagreements. Let's count them. So we have eight rounds, eight possibilities, Three times they received the card with the same number. The other five times they received the card with the different numbers. This is a possible history of what happens. We count the number of agreements and disagreements. So disagreement, agreement, agreement, disagreement, agreement, agreement, disagreement, disagreement. The number of agreements. So you have to think that you can run for billions and billions of times. People did the experiments with the large statistics. The number of agreements is not larger than the number of disagreements, it's equivalent, it's equal to the number 
of these agreements. The two are the same. The inequality is violated. And that's the big thing of Bell's theorem. So Bell's theorem, the word theorem says that it's a mathematical, it's a theoretical achievement. It is Bell. That locality, so the, the first part is Einstein, the first part. If there is locality, we, we have seen it before, if there is locality, then there is incompleteness. Uh, in, oh, I forgot an E. Uh, of course, this can be phrased in mathematical terms, but let's stick to the game. And then Bell tells that if there is, if there is the book incompleteness, then you have the inequalities. The number of, uh, this is it, if there is a book, then we count the entire statistics, there should be an inequality, a majority of agreements with respect to disagreements. People did the experiment, an aspect in the, 60, in the 80s, and the inequalities were violated. Conclusion, non-locality. Conclusion. Actually, Bell's even further uh, refined and simplified the theorem from this to this. Without, start, without going to the middle point of incompleteness, he phrased it in such a way that locality directly link, uh, gives inequalities which are violated, and then if the thesis is violated, we are in logic from back to the what, millennia ago, if the thesis is wrong, the hypothesis is wrong. There is non-locality. So, in a sense, in, in some sense, specific sense, Alice and Bob actually do things instantly with each other. In some sense, which would take some time to explain in a careful way, are telepathic. This is a, this is a vast achievement. Because it means, so this, there is an experiment behind that. It's not just my fantasy about what could happen. The, the Bell inequalities have been violated by a repeated number of experiments. Now no one is surprised anymore by that. That means that nature is non-local. Non and then it means that quantum non-locality poses a serious problem with respect to special relativity, or general, to relativity, which is grounded, which is based on the idea of locality. And in fact, there is a problem. There is a con oh, other mistake here, sorry for the typos. So there is a, f a c <laughs> the spell checker didn't <laughs> check that. So the conflict is not direct, so things still hold somewhere, but it exists. And as of today, no one knows what to do. It's an open problem in the understanding on the foundations of physics. How it can be that relativity works so well, that quantum mechanics works, works so well, but the two are in conflict, one with the other. And then what about incompleteness? So we start with the completeness, with the Einstein complaining about the meaning of the wave function. What about, and we came up with non-locality. What about incompleteness? The question is open. There, are, there, there exist models according to which the theory is incomplete, Bowman mechanics, the one I told you before, and models according to which the theory is complete, they're called collapse models. So still, at the moment, there are different possibilities, and experiments are not capable of deciding among the two. But this is another story. And thank you for your attention. This is my, the end of my presentation.